This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a customer phoning a builder to discuss some work she would like him to do on her home. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Thorndykes? Good morning. Is that Mr Thorndyke? Speaking. How can I help? I've got quite a few things which need painting and fixing in the flat, and I wonder whether you'd be able to do the work. I'm sure I'd be able to help, but let me take down a few details. Yes, of course. Well, uh, firstly, how did you hear about us? It was my friend May Hampton. You did some excellent work for her a couple of years ago. Do you remember? Oh, yes. That was in West Park Flats. Lovely lady. Yes, she is. And what's your name, please? It's Edith Pargeter. Edith, can you spell your surname, please? It's P-A-R-G-E-T-T-E-R. Double T, right. And do you live in West Park Flats as well? No, actually, it's East Park, Flat 4. Oh, right. That's over the road, I seem to remember. Quite difficult to get to. Yes, it's at the back of the library. Right, I know. And uh, what's your phone number? 875-934. But I'm out a great deal in the afternoons and evenings. So would the best time to ring you be in the morning? Yes. Fine, I've made a note of that. Can I just ask, I'll be in a van, and I know parking's rather difficult around your flat. Where would you recommend? Well, I always tell people in larger vehicles to park by the post box on the other side of the road from the entrance. Good, thanks. And will you be able to give me a full itemised quote? Oh, yes. I'll list all the jobs separately with individual prices. That'd be a great help. No problem. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Now, what would you like me to do? Firstly, and most urgently, is in the kitchen. 
With all the weather damage, the glass in the door has cracked and I'd need that fixing. I presume you mean replacing? Oh, yes, and as soon as possible. What I'll do is come round tomorrow morning and do that immediately. Oh, thank you so much. The other things aren't so urgent, but... Now, I'll make a note of everything you want doing. Well, in the kitchen, I'd like some painting doing. All the kitchen walls? Just the area over the cooker. It's very greasy. Right. It does tend to get that way. Yes. Well, if you want a proper job done, what I'd need to do is strip the old paint and plaster it about a week before I paint it. Of course. Now, May tells me you also do work in the garden. That's right. Well, I'd like you to replace a fence. Just one? Yes, at the far end. Fine. Shouldn't be a problem. And that's the lot. Fine. Yeah, as I say, I can come round tomorrow morning to look over things with you. Well, that's great. Thank you. So, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow at... That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a student housing officer giving a talk to a group of university students concerning dormitory renovations. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. After months of discussion and planning, we are very pleased to announce that the renovations will be made to the west wing of the university dormitories. Now, with this good news comes some bad, as there will be some disruptions to your living environment. But we think once you hear our plans, you're going to be very happy with what we will be doing. Firstly, if you'll just take a moment to look at the plans we gave you as you came in. Firstly, on the eastern side of the wing, you'll notice that there will be a change in the existing front entrance. It will be removed to another location on the opposite side of the wing. I'm sure that a lot of you will be glad for that, as our present configuration didn't allow for enough lighting. With the renovations will also come the removal of the existing staircase, but not the column beside it. Now, as we move west, we come to the location of the new security entrance. As with the old one, there will still be a need for some new lighting, so we're planning to install a number of overhead lights, which will make entering and exiting safer for you all. It'll be at this new security entrance that the new wall will be built to a two-story height. This gives you an idea of the size of the construction. Overall, the width will be around six meters, with the overall length being around 10, which I'm sure many of you are going to really enjoy. More room for all of you living in the West Wing. Are there any questions? Before you listen to the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, as I mentioned, there will be some issues we will have to overcome regarding the renovations. The first will be relocating some of you to new dormitories. 30 students will be moving for a total of six weeks. Now, of those who will be moving, you will be distributed to three other temporary locations, the north, south, and east dorm wings. Ten students will be relocated to each wing. This means that some of you are going to need to get packing. Don't worry about your new location. We're doing all we can to make your new temporary dorms as comfortable as possible. In fact, as I speak, we're making steps to ensure that you have study desks, lamps, and computer facilities, and all of the other facilities you require to successfully continue on with your studies. We're even repainting several of the rooms in the preparation for your arrival. The changes to your dorms will be starting within a week if you have any problems, don't hesitate to contact my office. Now I'm sure some of you have questions. I'm happy to answer them now. Based on crackles with Rob's website. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear Stephanie, who is thinking about taking a one-year course in children's literature, talking to Trevor, who is currently taking the course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, Trevor. Hello, Stephanie. You said you wanted to talk about the course I'm taking on literature for children. That's right. I'm thinking of doing it next year, but I'd like to find out more about it first. OK. Well, as you probably know, it's a one-year course. It's divided into six modules, and you have to take all of them. One of the most interesting ones, for me at least, was about the purpose of children's literature. You mean whether it should just entertain children, or should be educational as well? Right, and whether the teaching should be factual, giving them information about the world, or ethical, teaching them values. Mm. What's fascinating is that the writer isn't necessarily conscious of the message they're conveying. For instance, a story might show a child who has a problem as a result of not doing what an adult has told them to do, implying that children should always obey adults. Oh, I see what you mean. That module made me realise how important stories are. They can have a significant effect on children as they grow up. Actually, it inspired me to have a go at it myself, just for my own interest. I know I can't compete with the really popular stories, like the Harry Potter books, they're very good. And even young kids like my seven-year-old niece love reading them. Hmm. I'm very interested in illustrations in stories. 
Is that covered in the course? Yes, there's a module on pictures and how they're sometimes central to the story. Hmm, that's good. I remember some frightening ones I saw as a child and I can still see them vividly in my mind years later. Pictures can be so powerful, just as powerful as words. I've always enjoyed drawing, so that's the field I want to go into when I finish the course. I bet that module will be really helpful. I'm sure it will. We also studied comics in that module, but I'm not convinced of their value, not compared with books. Mm. One of the great things about words is that you use your imagination, but with a comic you don't have to. But children are so used to visual input on TV, video games and so on. There are plenty of kids who wouldn't even try to read a book, so I think comics can serve a really useful purpose. You mean it's better to read a comic than not to read at all? Mm. Yes, I suppose you're right. I just think it's sad when children don't read books. What about books for girls and books for boys? Does the course go into that? Yes, there's a module on it. For years, lots of stories, in English at least, assumed that boys went out and did adventurous things and girls stayed at home and played with dolls. I was amazed how many books were targeted at just one sex or the other. Of course, this reflects society as it is when the books are written. That's true. So it sounds as though you think it's a good course. Definitely. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Have you been reading lots of children's stories to help you decide whether to take the course? Yeah, I've gone as far back as the late 17th century, though I know there were earlier children's stories. So does that mean you've read Perrault's fairy tales, Cinderella, The Sleeping Beauty and so on? Yes. They must be important because no stories of that type had been written before. These were the first. Then there's the Swiss Family Robinson. I haven't read that. The English name makes it sound as though Robinson is the family surname. But a more accurate translation would be the Swiss Robinsons because it's about a Swiss family who are shipwrecked like Robinson Crusoe in the novel of a century earlier. Well, I never knew that. Have you read Hoffman's The Nutcracker and the Mouse King? Wasn't that the basis for Tchaikovsky's ballet, The Nutcracker? That's right. It has some quite uh, bizarre elements. I hope you've read Oscar Wilde's The Happy Prince. It's probably my favourite children's story of all time. Oh, mine too. And it's so surprising because Wilde is best known for his plays, and most of them are very witty, but The Happy Prince is really moving. I struggled with Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, three long books, and I gave up after one. It's extremely popular, though. Yeah, but whereas something like The Happy Prince just carried me along with it, the Lord of the Rings took more effort than I was prepared to give it. I didn't find that. I love it. Mm. Another one I've read is War Horse. Oh, yes. It's about the First World War, isn't it? Hardly what you'd expect for a children's story. Exactly. But it's been very successful. Have you read any... That is the end of part three.
You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part 3. Part 4 You will hear a lecture about the Inuit Eskimos of Alaska and Canada. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. In our lecture today, we will continue our study of people who inhabit the northernmost regions of the world. Our focus will be on the native inhabitants of Alaska and Canada, the Inuit Eskimos. They have been called the native inhabitants, as the Inuit were the people who had most recently migrated across the gap between Alaska and Siberia. Distinctly Asian in origin, the Inuit, which is literally translated the people in their native language, developed their civilization in what is now the Bering Sea region about 1,000 years ago. Their culture spread eastward and is called the Thule culture, after the place in northern Greenland where archaeologists first discovered it. The first Europeans to meet Inuit people were Norse settlers in what is now northern Newfoundland, Canada. These settlers lived there for a short time around 1000 AD. Approximately 500 years later, beginning in the 1500s, European whalers fishing crews, and explorers met many Inuit along the coast of Labrador. Russians and other Europeans first met Alaskan Inuit in the 1700s. One hundred years later, in the mid-1800s, whalers began to hunt in the Arctic. Some Inuit were employed by whalers and traded with them during that time. Perhaps one of the most interesting aspects of the Inuit is how they were able to survive and grow in such a harsh Arctic environment. Firstly, and not surprisingly, their homes were well adapted to the freezing conditions. They lived in predominantly two types of housing that would keep them warm. In the cold summer they would live in tents that were made from the skin of the animals they had hunted for food, and they also traveled in boats. These were called umiaks by the natives. In the winter, they would live in houses made of sod, and when on hunting trips, they would commute by dog sled and build temporary houses made from ice. These igloos, which is the Inuit word for house, were uniquely made with a sharp blade carved out of walrus tusk. They would cut large blocks of hard packed snow, about three meters wide, out of the ground. The blocks would then be used to build a six meter dome over a wide, shallow hole. Within one or two hours, an igloo up to ten meters in length could be built. It was weatherproof and large enough to house an entire family. Very early in their history, they managed to develop the technology to hunt the huge bowhead whale, which was the staple food source for them at that time. They also hunted walruses and seals. On land, they hunted polar bears, moose, and various other game. The harsh environment in which they lived meant that a steady supply of food was often difficult to come by. Therefore, the Inuit were a people constantly on the move, looking for food, which meant that their dwellings had to be easily built and easily dismantled. 
They inhabited the wide open land and, as such, moved freely around it in search of food. Today the traditional way of life has basically ended for the Inuit. They live in wooden homes rather than in snow houses, sod houses, or tents. They wear modern clothing instead of animal skin garments. Most Inuit speak English and Russian. Some speak Danish, while fewer still continue to hold on to their cultural roots by passing on to the younger generation their native language. The kayak and umiak, their principal means of travel, have given way to the motorboat, and the snowmobile has replaced the dog team. The combined percentage of the Inuit population in Alaska and Canada stands at 63%, the latter being 29% and the former around 34%. Some Alaskan Inuit live in towns and cities, but the majority live in small settlements and hunt and fish for most of their food. Most of those in Canada live in towns and housing provided by... That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.